Hi, welcome to another video and it's back to 35mm camera review time and in this one we are looking at there we go the Minolta SRT 101 now the Minolta um, SRT 101 is an incredibly popular um, choice for people starting out in film photography well if they want to 35mm SLR it is anyway. So I want to talk a little bit about the camera, um, what it does, as usual run through the pros and cons of the camera, but also talk about why as good as it is, and don't get me wrong, it is a good camera, I think there's a better alternative out there. Now that's not to say that if you've got one of these, or you're looking at one of these, it's the wrong choice. It's purely that there is another choice out there that may be a slightly better option. Okay, so let's get things going. The um, SRT 101, first produced in 1966, I believe, um, and was produced for around about a decade. So 10 years is a good production run for any camera. Now, these were aimed by Minolta at their kind of serious amateur stroke semi-professional um, shooter. As a result, one of the great things about these is an awful lot of them have been well looked after because they weren't just, you know, bought by families, chucked in a bag, ignored, that kind of thing. But they also didn't appeal to that many pure pros either um, um, because professional photographers very rarely... Um, how can I say this? I was going to say they very rarely look after their equipment, but their equipment leads a harder life is probably a better way to put it because it's more of a disposable asset than a camera would be for a um, serious amateur. That's probably the politest way to put it. Um, in terms of what the camera does, it's through the lens metering, um, one second through to a thousandth in terms of shutter speed, you've got bulb on there, you've got a depth of field preview, self timer on there, um, early models, which this one is, had a mirror lockup, which is that little round button there, you just give it a twist to that angle and it locks the mirror up. Um, I believe from reading that that was removed on um, later models, so if you've got mirror lockup, you're looking at an earlier model rather than a later model. Um, you've got flash sync PC connectors just here. One thing to note, it is a cold shoe, not a hot shoe. Um, battery for metering, and I want to talk about the metering a little bit later on. Uh, inside the back of the camera, rubberized silk cloth shutter, nothing really um, stands out or revolutionary in the back end of this either, so it's an attractive camera as well. Okay, so let's talk a bit more about it. Pros and cons, so we'll start off with the pros. <laughs> number one uh, links back to something I said at the introduction. Um, these were available for a 10-year period starting the mid-60s through to the mid-70s. As a result, there is an awful lot of them available. So if you're looking for an SRT 101, you're not really going to be struggling to find it, and to a degree you're going to be spoiled for choice uh, with them, which is great. It really is, because it means you can be a bit more choosy about what you go for. As I also mentioned earlier on, because of the market these were aimed at and the main people who bought them, the ones you do find tend to be in at least good condition upwards, so they tend not to have led hideously hard lives, which is great. So it's a widely available camera and you normally get some pretty good stock to pick from when you buy them second hand. So yeah, it's, it's a definite pro, the availability of these on the market. So point number two the lens availability for them. Now, these will take uh, either 
Minolta MC lenses or MD lenses. Now the MC there doesn't stand for multi-coated, most of them are multi-coated, but that's not what it stands for. Um, it's the mount system. So the MC is meter coupled, so it works with the meter, you don't have to stop down, it stops down automatically, all of that kind of thing. So it will take the MC lenses, although I don't know why I'm pointing to that as an MC lens, because that's an MC lens. That's an MD lens, which it will also take. Now the MDs were built and introduced with the later models, so they worked well with the um, X300, X500, X700 series, and, <coughs> Apologies. The main thing there is they've got a little tab that allows you to lock it onto F22 for the automatic priority modes on those particular cameras. You don't have that on the MC lenses. Now, I've got two lenses that I tend to shoot with on this, um, and I the 50mm 1.7 here, cracking little lens that I picked up with the body when I bought it, and then I can't remember where I picked this up from. It may have been in a job lot, uh, but it's a 135, uh, sorry, 135 millimeter 3.5 um, Rockall QD, um, and that's in an MC mount, and that's a really nice little um, short telephoto, great for portraiture and things like that. Oh, and by the way, the shots you're seeing in this were all taken on Candido 200. Not my favourite film in the entire world, and I will link somewhere above to uh, my review of Candido 200 and the issues I found with it, but that's not to say any of that's the fault of the glass here. The other great thing about the glass um, is it's fairly freely available and it's reasonably priced. So there's a good amount of it, it's reasonably priced, and on the whole, the Rockall lenses perform really well, particularly if you stick to the primes. So cheap lenses, good selection, good quality. Combine that with a freely available camera body, you're onto a bit of a winner there, in all honesty. Pro number three is the viewfinder. Now, the viewfinder in this is, in keeping with an awful lot of 35mm SLRs, really bright, really big, really easy to use. Now, it doesn't have a split focus in it, which a lot of people may look on as a bit of a problem, but in all honesty, it's so nice and bright that even with the um, matte screen, etc., it's a doddle to actually get good sharp focus on it and it's nice and quick and easy. If you've only ever used digital cameras, particularly if you've only ever used um, APS-C, what you'll find when you move to something like this is the viewfinder just seems absolutely huge and bright. I had it the other way around. When I moved from 35mm and film over to digital, it was kind of like, why is everything so dark and dingy? But, you know, pros and cons, that's the way it goes. But really nice viewfinder. In terms of the viewfinder information, you've got the needle for the match needle metering, and I'll come on and talk about that a little more in a moment. And you've got the shutter speeds down the bottom. And that's pretty much it. So there's not a lot getting in the way. It would be nice if you saw the aperture in the viewfinder via a Judas window or something similar, but you can't have everything. But that doesn't detract from the fact that it's got a really really nice viewfinder on it right on to our final pro and that is the metering system um and the match needle side of it it's got a really nice match needle metering i'm a big fan of match needle metering i find it really intuitive and easy to use just having two needles that basically you get to coincide and bingo there you go you're done um and it works really well, but that's not what I wanted to talk about because this actually has a really clever metering system um, and it's called, and hopefully if I get close enough you can just about see it there, CLC, um, which is contrast level something, I'll double check and put it on the screen, and in many ways it can be considered an early precursor to um, matrix metering because basically what it's doing is it's taking it's got two um, metering systems in there so it's got two meter reading systems in there one of which is biased to the top of the screen one of which is biased towards the bottom of the screen and what it does is it looks at the contrast level between those two and compensates for it 
Now, this is very similar to the system that the, I believe, Canon EF had in it. Um, and it works really well for landscape work because basically what it's doing is it's it's correcting so that you don't have to for the massive contrast dif difference between a sky and your ground and the landscape and works really well from that point of view. Um, so it's quite impressive, particularly given its age, as I say, mid 60s, but it does have a downside if you're not aware of how to get around it. And that is obviously the sky, when looking landscape, is up there and the ground is down here. But if you're shooting in portrait format, the sky is over here and the ground is over here, also the camera thing. So you've got a bit of a situation there where in portrait mode, you might need to correct for this. And um, it's worth then thinking about what you're metering or maybe moving down metering off of that, recomposing and shooting or metering in a landscape format. Once you've got the metering there and held, turn and shoot. Um, but. That foible aside, and as long as you know about it, you can work around it quite easily, is, yeah, you know, it, it, it's not to the detriment of the really nice metering system on there. And it's a nice little quirk at the end of the day, showing off, you know, early attempts at matrix metering and things like that. <laughs> So those are all of our pros. We've got to talk about some cons on this. Now, there aren't a huge number of them being perfectly honest, um, but I do want to talk about them. And the first one might sound really, really nitpicky, but it is something that annoys me mildly every time I use the camera. And that is that the on, off and battery check switch for the metering is underneath the camera and it's just for me it's completely counterintuitive to turn it over and have to use this kind of textured wheel that you have to kind of apply a bit of pressure with your finger and turn to actually switch the metering on or off or do a battery check on it and that really is quite annoying um, it's not in a great place and it's not the nicest thing to use. As I said, I know it's a really tiny thing, but it does frustrate me slightly. The other thing that's kind of related to the ergonomic side of things there is you've got no shutter lock, okay? So this is one where, for safety's sake, after you've taken a shot, you're probably not best winding on until you get to the next shot you want to take because there is a risk of accidentally shooting a frame. Now, back in the day in the 60s, film was cheap as chips, certainly compared to what it is now, so that wasn't quite so much of an issue. Um, but nowadays with the price of film and film per shot, it is something you do want to consider. But as I say, those are really minor foibles around the ergonomics. Okay. I want to move on now and talk about con number two and I am aware that my last two cons might cause some reactions particularly from people who own SRT 101s. Now the first thing is because I'm going to talk about build quality I want to talk about build quality in two different stages. When you pick the camera up it's got a really reassuring heft to it. It is from an external point of view, incredibly well made. It's nice metal construction, it's got some leatherette around it, it's, it feels reassuringly solid to use. Okay, it, it does. And from um, an external point of view, it's great. However, and if you don't believe me on this, go and watch some stripped down videos of SRT 101s. The mechanicals underneath, in some circumstances, can barely be called mechanicals because an awful lot of the connections done on a lot, that on a lot of its contemporary competition were actually mechanical, physical connections done by gears, rods, pulleys, those kind of things, are actually done by waxed string in the 101. So. 
when you turn the meter it's actually pulling lengths of wax string and things like that underneath. Now that's not the greatest thing in the world because it does have a finite lifespan for something like that. Plus if you can find somebody who can repair one that's gone in that regard good luck with the price because I very much doubt it's going to be particularly cheap redoing something like that. Now it's however it's not as bad as notifications on my phone do apologize it's not as bad as it necessarily first sounds because as i've mentioned a couple of times in the video the people who owned these tended to be serious amateurs and as a result they've been looked after extremely well so mine functions perfectly well it's just be aware that there is waxed string controlling some of the operations underneath the skin here that could give way. And that is something that you do need to keep in mind, okay? So it is an important consideration. Okay, my final con. And this might be a bit unfair, but I do personally feel I need to mention it. Now these tend to go in the UK for around about £150-ish, depending on condition, with a standard lens on them. This, the Canon FTB, also goes for around about £150, depending on condition, with a standard lens on it. So they are directly comparable in terms of price. They have pretty much the same functionality on them with one to one second to a thousandth bulb similar exposure range etc etc on them but the canon ftb is for my money the better camera now its metering isn't quite as sophisticated but it's got a better match needle display for reasons that i explain in a video that i'll link to up here it has no waxed string in its mechanicals it, it is purely levers and things like that and in the early ones they were all metal they did replace it with engineered uh, plastic in the later ones but it's still more robust than what we're talking about with the srt 101 my personal foibles are also addressed on this that the on off switch for the metering is located on the top plate and is a nice simple to use lever and it has a lockout for the shutter um, and for me it's just a slightly better package now which one's right for you well i can't tell you that to a large degree it depends on what you're looking for you know you've got to take into account which lens range appeals to you the most now both the canon fd and fc glass that this will also take are extremely good lenses um, the best of them are comparable with the best of the rockall lens range so you're on pretty much of a muchness just there um, it's arguably slightly better built under the skin but it is a larger and heavier camera so all of these things have to be taken into account now don't get me wrong I love both of these and I like shooting with them but if I was forced to choose between the two <clears throat> and told I could only use one of them from now on for me it would be the FTB but for you that might be different you're not going to go wrong between either of these in my personal opinion okay this is just my pick for the reasons I've gone through but don't let that necessarily dissuade you from the 101 because it is a really nice camera to use and is a good camera to shoot with and a solid film investment okay it's just it would be remiss of me if I didn't point out the FTB at this point So there we go, those are my thoughts on the Minolta SRT 101, its pros and cons, and my conclusion on it. If you have enjoyed this video, please do hit the like button, and if you want to see more content like this, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified when new content gets uploaded. Thanks very much for watching everyone, take care, bye.